in this session we would try to understand something about tinea solium and the pathogenic invasion that it causes. It's an animal that belongs to phylum platyhelminthus. Platy stands for flat and helminth stands for worm. So it's a flat worm. Triploblastic, acelimate, bilaterally symmetrical animal. That is presence of all three germ layers. No true coelomic cavity and single plane of symmetry. Under which Tinea comes under class Cystura. Cystura includes all kinds of tapeworms. So this Tinea sodium also is a kind of tapeworm. Under morphology we will try to understand why is it called as tapeworm. First of all as I said it belongs to plate element so it's a flat worm and it's called as tapeworm because it has a ribbon like body dorsal ventrally flattened and long ribbon like body it's provided with so it's called as a tapeworm the body is divisible into three main parts scolex that is head region neck that is middle part and proglottids these are false segments now these are called as false segments because there is no system which runs common for all these segments every segment is almost like an independent part of the body <clears throat> together all the proglottids they form what we will call as strobula strobula that is all the proglottids together now this is an endoparasite. Mindful, there are uh, two other species under Tinea, Tinea saginata and Tinea asiatica. But Tinea solium is the one which is uh, mainly known to cause infections in human beings. So we will focus upon that. Uh, so being an endoparasite, it has all suitable endoparasitic adaptations. That is. Scolex adapted for attaching to the uh, internal tissue. It's an intestinal parasite. So Scolex is adapted for holding to the intestinal wall. Rest of the body, including Scolex, is covered with a thick protective covering. That would be protected from the enzymes, whatever are functional in the intestine. A complex life cycle, complex reproductive system, but the animals are hermaphroditic, bisexual. Now what is Colex like? See, this is the Colex, this is the neck and these are the proglottids. That is together we will call it as strobula. Now Colex as could be seen, it has four suckers. These are the suckers, four suckers on four sides. And right at the tip there is something called as a rose tailum. Right at the tip there is something called as rose tailum. Now rose tailum actually is a double ring of tiny hooks. It is with the help of these hooks and the suckers it holds to the intestinal wall. And the proglottids, as I said, there are about uh, 800 to 1000 proglottids which will form the entire body, strobila as I said. So that is the general morphology. Now what is a proglottid? Out of these uh, 800 to 1000 proglottids, first few are absolutely immature proglottids. Next few are sexually mature and the last few contain only fertilized eggs. So these last few segments which contain only fertilized eggs, these are called as gravid proglottids, gravid proglottids. So first few immature proglottids, next few sexually mature proglottids and last few gravid proglottids. That's how they could be distinguished. A single mature proglottid, let's have a look at it. Fine. Now as I said, every segment is almost 
every proglot is almost independent because it has a separate opening you can see it here but this opening is connected to the reproductive system whatever you are seeing here is the entire reproductive system what is so uh, the reproductive system this brown colored thing right in the center is the uterus where the uh, eggs will be fertilized and will be stored for a while these dot like things around it blue colored that is the testes this is the ovary and here there is a seminal receptacle the sperms which are collected by uh, from these testes they will be temporarily stored in the seminal receptacle the eggs would get fertilized and temporarily be stored in the uterus and through here they could be released out now to support the system there are some other parts this is seminal vesicle there are certain mammalian gland and all those which would be helping in uh, sustenance of eggs for a longer while now this is a sexually mature proglottid when it is gravid it contains nothing but the fertilized eggs none of these organs will be visible in that and that's about the morphology let's then understand the life cycle as a seed the mature uh, proglottid contains both male and female reproductive organs normally it prefers to uh, go for cross fertilization but if it's not possible it goes for self fertilization within the same animal sperms and ova would be released they would get fertilized in the uterus and the fertilized eggs will be formed thereof rest of the life cycle see this animal which we are talking about as a mature or an adult uh, tinea solium it is an intestinal parasite it is found in human beings as well so human being is its primary host that is human being is its definitive host in which the adult stays attached to the intestinal wall after the uh, eggs are fertilized after the gravid proglottids are formed these gravid proglottids are egested through feces and thereafter these may rupture to release the eggs or they may say in that if these eggs are released out then they can enter another host which could be human being or could be pigs now these eggs are in a stage which is called as oncosphere it has a highly protective covering oncosphere it has a protective covering and the egg will be inside it fertilized egg that's the oncosphere now these oncosphere can stay uh, dormant for a very long span of time and whenever possible they can enter another host if it's pigs or other herbivores through direct grazing they can enter uh, that animal but into humans they can pass through the fecal oral route through contaminated food or water they can enter another human inside the alimentary tract they pass through the esophagus through the stomach and here the the covering the cyst the protective layer may break open and a tiny larva comes out this larva is called as cysti circus at times this may develop into an adult but sometimes what happens the oncosphere directly enters the intestine it penetrates the intestinal wall gets into the blood stream and through blood it can be carried to different parts of the body so if oncosphere enters the blood stream and goes to different parts it causes a different kind of disorder but if it ruptures if it 
hatches and develops into an adult, it causes a different disorder. Now, what is that? We will come to understand that in the uh, pathogenicity part. So, this is how the life cycle can continue. If the adult is developed in the intestine, it can uh, release the gravid proglottids, the infection can continue. That's about the life cycle. Now here the primary host is human being, secondary host could be a pig or any herbivore. Through that secondary host, it can be transmitted into human beings through undercooked pig meat, pork. Undercooked pork can be uh, responsible for transmitting the uh, oncospheres into another human being, another definitive host. And then the life cycle can continue. Now then we come to the pathogenicity, the disease and the uh, rest of the aspects of it. When the adult is in the intestine, it causes teniasis, teniasis. So inside the human beings, it can stay alive for a very long span of time, for a few months to a few years. It can stay there in the intestine. Even if the proglottids are detached, new proglottids can be formed. So it can remain there, it can keep reproducing. That is how it uh, keeps causing the teniasis. But teniasis is relatively a benign disorder. That is um, minor symptoms like nausea, vomiting, maybe a mild fever, abdominal tenderness, diarrhea, dysentery. This kind of disorders it can cause. Rarely fatal. So that is how teniasis can uh, continue. It can continue for a long time. It can continue even without symptoms for a long time. But as I said, the, uh, the gravid proglottids when they are released out and when they enter another host, maybe uh, another primary host of course, this time if the oncospheres enter the intestinal wall and through bloodstream they get into different part, then they cause a disorder which is called as cysticercosis. Cysticercosis and this becomes relatively a serious disorder. Where can it happen? Through bloodstream, they can be carried to subcutaneous tissue that is just below the skin. They can be carried to muscles. They can be carried to eyes or to brain. Depending upon where they have been carried, they cause different disorders. If in the subcutaneous tissues, they will cause formation of uh, certain nodules, palpable nodules, nodules which can be sensed from outside, which can be felt from outside. So palpable nodules can result in, in the subcutaneous infections. In muscles also, they can cause certain uh, nodule formations, which may not be so easily palpable. If they enter the eyes, redness of the eyes, uh, maybe a watering of eyes, irritation in the eyes, and at times it can even lead to blindness. But if they enter the brain, then they lead to neurocysticercosis, which is considered to be a serious disorder. Why serious? Nominal symptoms like fever, headache can start, but thereafter serious symptoms could result. That is, there could be dizziness, there could be epileptic uh, seizures, and this can even result into death. Extreme infection can even result into death if it's not treated properly. So, neurocystic sarcosis is known to be a serious disorder, which can be caused when the oncospheres enter the brain. Let's talk about the treatment. If it's teniasis,
Albendazol. Could be one common uh, medicine that is used. Along with this, Niclosamide is administered. These two can take care of TSS. Uh, there's one more medicine called Praziquantin. This is also administered for treating it. But in case of TNS, this can take care of uh, ear infection completely. But if it is neurocystis that causes, then the, uh, the point to be taken into consideration is if the outer covering of the uh, oncosphere dissolves, then that dissolving uh, cyst like covering may stimulate a severe inflammatory response from the nervous tissue and that can lead to complications that can lead to serious consequences so when it comes to treatment of neurocystic sarcosis niclosamide praziquantel would be playing their role in treating the uh, the pathogen dealing with the pathogen but at the same time the side effects like uh, inflammation in the brain and all that also needs to be uh, taken care of and that is done by administering appropriate dosages of corticosteroids corticosteroids they will take care of the inflammation and these medicines will take care of the infection that is how it can be treated let us understand whether it is teniasis or cysticercosis or neurocysticercosis the disorder is treatable completely treatable of course timely uh, diagnosis is required but the thing is diagnosis may not happen immediately because teniasis it remains in the intestine for a very long span without causing any symptoms similar thing can happen about cysticercosis Neurocystic sarcosis generally leads to some primary indications. So diagnosis could be done, treatment could start. But then as we have been uh, discussing right from the beginning, instead of treating the disorder, let us prevent it. So how to prevent it? As I said, the main path for transmission of the disease is first of all fecal oral route. So, hygienic food, hygienic food sources would take care of fecal oral root. Undercooked pig meat can transmit the disease. It can even lead to cysticercosis. So, properly cooked meat would take care of this kind of infection as well. In simple words, appropriate food habits will take care of teniasis or cysticercosis or neurocysticercosis that is how it can be prevented which means prevention is possible treatment is also possible but if not done in time can lead to serious consequences how do you like the video subscribe to it share it with your friends or family do not forget to post your comments or suggestions